Now, if we consider maybe that way as a dead end, as perhaps something that we need to let go of altogether, any kind of um, propositional statement needs to somehow be either treated far more lightly or maybe symbolically, but essentially needs to be let go of. And what therefore would replace it? In the case of the goodness of God, I would argue that we need to move to the practice, not of believing anything about what is good, but by doing good. Which I think is, again, very much in the idea of concern for one's neighbour. It's not a belief, but it's an action. It's a grounded in a relationship with a specific case of suffering or conflict or crisis or tragedy within the particular life of a person or a community, or nowadays we might expand it to the environment as a whole. That my um, Christianity or my Buddhism is concerned with acting out these values, doing something, rather than clinging on to certain metaphysical doctrines and beliefs. And likewise in Buddhism, I think it's in a sense an entirely irrelevant point whether life is suffering or not, but rather the task at hand is to embrace suffering, is to be able to open one's heart and one's mind to the reality of pain, be it in oneself, be it in one's neighbour, be it in one's society, be it in sub-Saharan Africa. The practice of dukkha is the practice of embracing it. And I feel that the meditation we briefly did at the beginning of this session, in a sense, provides us with a framework to embrace the situation we're in, to be able to say, yes, this is my mind right now. These are my feelings right now. This is the world that I'm part of right now. So meditation is not a sort of stepping back and rather coldly observing what's going on. It's also a profound practice of acceptance. Not in a sense of resignation, but in a way in which we're able to unconditionally say yes to our life, to this life, to life itself. Now, do we have any basis in canonical Buddhist literature to support this kind of view? You probably are not familiar with the work of a man called K.R. Norman. Now, K.R. Norman is probably the world's leading is probably the world's leading expert on mid-Indo-Aryan Prakrit. A mid-Indo-Aryan Prakrit is um, a spoken language that prevailed after the classical period of Sanskrit and the Vedas in India and before the modern period of Hindu, Hindi and Urdu and the languages that are spoken on the subcontinent today. In terms of this discussion, um, the, the Indo-Aryan Prakrit that matters is Pali. Pali is a spoken language. It's not exactly the language the Buddha would have used, but very similar. Now, K.R. Norman, who's not a Buddhist, he doesn't have a, a theological axe to grind, um, wrote an essay in 1992 called The Four Noble Truths which are, of course, the standard doctrine that all Buddhists are supposed to adhere to. In an analysis of the text, in other words, into the grammar and the syntax and all of those rather tricky philological areas, he concludes at the end of this essay that in the earliest version of the first discourse, the words noble truth do not appear. In other words, what we now 
know so well as the Four Noble Truths, it seems, were originally not called the Four Noble Truths. Since that original text has not come down to us, we cannot say for certain what the text did say. All we can, I think, safely surmise is that the Buddha spoke of the Four. The Four. In Christianity, you say the Trinity. You don't have to list what they are. But the Four. Now, what are these four? If we um, now strip away from the Buddha's first discourse the notion of noble truth, what we come down to are four elements, four key elements. The first one is dukkha, usually translated as suffering, but rather unsatisfactorily so, I think. The second is what is called the arising, the third is called the ceasing, and the fourth is called the path. And these four, I feel, are a bit like the four amino acids that make up DNA. In other words, DNA endlessly reconfigures these four amino acids and generates the great wide diversity of living forms, organisms that we know on the planet. And I feel that these four, likewise, are, as it were, the, the four key codes in the operating system of what we call Buddhism. Once you take out the idea of noble truth, you have removed the notion that Buddhism is basically about somehow having a correct apprehension of what is true. Personally, I don't think the Buddha was very interested in truth or reality. Another doctrine that you find right throughout Buddhism is that of the two truths, ultimate truth and conventional truth. Sometimes it's translated as absolute truth and relative truth. All traditions share that view. The world is somehow divided between what is ultimately real, and that might be emptiness or Buddha nature or whatever, as opposed to what is just conventionally real, that Wellington is the capital of New Zealand, and such propositions. Once again, when we go back to the earliest canonical sources, we find that not once in the Pali Canon does the Buddha use that distinction. The terms are just not there. We have a very clear example of a doctrine that has been imposed upon the earliest teachings at a later date. So it's quite striking, I find, that two very central ideas, the four truths, the two truths, probably did not occur, were not used in the early tradition. Part of the process whereby Buddhism became a religion, became a belief system, became a metaphysical doctrine, I think involved the introduction of the concept of truth. Truth as opposed to falsity. Truth as, a as a somehow referring to or corresponding to some metaphysical reality. Another statement, this time from Gianni Vattimo, from his book, A Farewell to Truth. <laughs> he thinks along similar lines. Um, he says, when the word truth is uttered, a shadow of violence is cast as well. And I don't think we have to think very long and hard about, um, uh, about what that means. I mean, so much of our history as human beings, and I think for an example that of colonialism, is very much premised on one group of people claiming that they have access through some revelation to some ultimate truth, and it's their duty somehow to impose that on those who don't share that view. 
we can see it in the Inquisition, we can see it in any number of cases where people feel they need to justify the violence or oppression or suppression of others in the name of truth. So there is always, I think, even though it may not be acted out, the potential for violence as soon as we draw that line in the sand and say, we are the guys who've got the truth. And by definition, therefore, you, if you don't share our views, do not have the truth. So, as Vatimo suggests, perhaps we need to say farewell to truth. And, again, embrace not belief, but consider what we might do. Now, when you read the Buddha's first sermon, which um, I've already referred to, it's the first discourse he gave to the five ascetics that, with whom he had uh, practiced asceticism with for many years, in the Deer Park at Sarnath, shortly after his awakening. In the first sermon, he presents the four <laughs> you can see how to, it's very difficult to get out of that habit it's very difficult to unlearn uh, doctrines and ideas that have been so uh, integral to what we know in this case as Buddhism very difficult to get out of that habit but I feel it's very liberating to do so we don't have time this evening to analyse this text, so you'll just have to take my word for it, I'm afraid. But when you... It's a very short text, about two pages long. But the culmination of the discourse lies in the Buddha saying, this is what I mean by being awake. He says, it was not until um, my mind was entirely clear about every aspect of the four that I could consider myself to be fully awake. Now what does he mean by every aspect of the four? The preceding paragraph shows very clearly what he means. For each of the four he sets us a task and he regards his awakening as having recognized that task having performed it, and having accomplished it. In fact, in the, literally in the text it says the twelve aspects of the four. Four elements, each one recognised, performed, and accomplished as a task. So we really have four noble tasks, not four noble truths. <laughs> 